Hello, everybody. I do encourage you to sit down. Okay, we're going to start in one minute. Uh, so please do uh, sit down, and if you want to have a conversation, please do go outside to have it, because uh, my ministerial panel has many interesting things to say, if they're only given a chance. Thank you. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm John Gapper uh, with the Financial Times. Uh, we've had such an interesting discussion this morning uh, that uh, the time has rather flown. Uh, so we're starting a bit late. But we are intending to finish by 1 o'clock. I should just say that the ministerial dinner, which I believe, oh, sorry, lunch, which I believe was due to start at uh, 12.30, is going to be put back by half an hour. So don't worry. You can have food for thought, and then you are going to have food for your stomachs. You don't have to make a choice. Um, We've got uh, a very interesting and distinguished panel um, uh, with me today. Um, and uh, due to time, I'm not going to introduce every member of it. But as we go along, we can uh, introduce our ministerial colleagues and other panel members. Um, I think in the last panel, we heard a lot about the broad uh, outlook for the uh, world economy. And what we're tr going to try to do in this panel is maybe dig down into individual countries' experiences and see how they compare or contrast and try to draw some lessons for the theme of uh, productivity and inclusiveness. I'm going to start by uh, asking uh, Mario Centeno, the Minister of Finance for Portugal, to maybe give us just a brief uh, insight into what's been happening in his country and what have been the sort of main observations in terms of the productivity agenda? Mario. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I will um, say that uh, the experience of Portugal, when you look at it in the last decade, uh, mimics uh, what happened in many other OECD countries. Uh, we engage uh, in deep uh, uh, and broad-based uh, structural reforms, those started uh, already prior to the crisis with a very ambitious social security reform. Uh, then, uh, during the crisis, of course, we implemented a very large set of reforms, uh, those of the labor market. Actually, uh, right before the crisis, uh, we had uh, uh, the single uh, largest revision of the OECD employment protection legislation index uh, revision in towards fle higher flexibility. Uh, right now, we are engaging in uh, very uh, substantial reforms on public administration. So the story of the country in the last decade uh, has been one of uh, structural reforms. We uh, also uh, had a substantial improvement in education, the achievement levels uh, the graduation uh, shares improved a lot in our country. And um, more a cri on a crisis mode, uh, at least in terms of the speed, uh, the fiscal consolidation process is uh, underway and is reality. But uh, there are uh, always other sides of this coin. Uh, and we also observed an increase in inequality. We still have a very high unemployment. We witnessed in the last uh, 17 quarters, consecutive quarters, a reduction in the labor force, which is something very uh, unusual uh, and uh, unique and a matter of great concern for us. And uh, we still have uh, low productivity and low uh, total factor productivity growth. And, uh, um, if we move ahead, if I uh, am to move ahead uh, of this past experience and say what we should probably focus our attention more, uh, I think we um, need to pay uh, more attention on the allocation of resources, labor included. 
and not that much uh, on things that sometimes uh, uh, and often, sorry, markets do better, which is uh, the matter of flexibility. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that we need to look at uh, more adaptable uh, markets and allocation of resources than, than necessarily to, uh, and instead of uh, uh, issues related to the nominal, nominal flexibility. And uh, if I uh, may uh, add another uh, degree uh, to and what, uh, an already very, um, very uh, complex uh, relationship between product productivity and inclusiveness, I uh, think that we very often uh, forget about the idea of mobility. Mobility is really at the center of uh, our economy's productivity. And we, uh, and now maybe putting a broader tone in, in, my, uh, in this perspective, we have been observing in our economies a substantial reduction in worker rotation, in churning, which coupled with a, a substantial degree uh, of um, wage flexibility towards uh, observing wage cuts. In my country, data for the UK show precisely the same type of figures. We do observe every year more than 30% of the workers having their wage cuts cut even if they keep the same job. This is an outstanding amount of nominal flexibility, which is not coupled with mobility in terms of allocation of resources. And uh, we may proceed on that, but uh, I will leave this note uh, to the discussion. Okay, so that's very interesting. We're hearing about uh, wage flexibility downwards, but a lack of mobility that might help uh, people to rise up. Um, I'm gonna turn now to uh, Ildefonso Guajardo, the uh, Minister of the Economy for Mexico. Um, you've heard those comments about Portugal. Uh, what's the experience been in terms of productivity growth and these issues in Mexico? Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity. Well, Latin America as a whole has uh, definitely shown a chronic deficit of growth in productivity. Mexico, for instance, uh, since the 1990s to 2011, we have uh, facing uh, the reduction by about 8% in productivity. And obviously the question you ask is, come on, I mean, we have here Mexico has been extremely successful in guaranteeing economic stability, being very, very close to very good fundamentals for macro. And at the same time, Mexico had opened his economy, its economy for the last 20 years with 12, 12 trade agreements. Basically, we changed an economy that was only uh, total trade over GDP was about 27% in the 80s and now is about 65%. We transformed the production uh, uh, phase of Mexico before the 90s where exports were mainly oil and minerals, 65%, and today is 89 manufacturing, complex manufacturing. But at the same time, when you look at the productivity behavior in the country for economic agents, you see that big firms are highly productive but six or seven times more productive than in small firms. And when you look at the country territorially, you see the northern part of Mexico and the center where the automotive clusters are and the airspace industry are, are much, much more productive than the south part of Mexico. Multiples by six or seven as well. And so the problem that you create uh, with the opening when you do not do reforms on time is that you create to Mexico's, the highly dynamic, productive Mexico connected to foreign trade, and the Mexico that has not been able to really link to these new developments. And now, what is missing in this picture is that since we opened Mexico to the North American Free Trade Agreement, we should have introduced those reforms. Because how can you ask a medium-sized firm to be part of a global value chain in the automobile industry if you are not giving them competitive electricity prices, when we started uh, this process, a Mexican company compared to a, a company in Canada or the US was paying twice as much electricity. 
uh, financing was was very 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 low uh, level of, uh, of 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 financing in terms of uh, uh, interest rates, much higher interest rates than world markets. Uh, compet uh, antitrust uh, if, uh, or competitive structures. How can you guarantee small and medium-sized enterprises competitive inputs, highly concentrated markets? So at the end of the day, the story is that when you don't create true reforms, how to really enforce the change in your country, it's going to be very difficult to level the playing fields for all the economic agents to benefit from stable financial markets and from opening your economy. So at the end of the day, those two elements will not be enough or sufficient if you don't really make reforms happen in your domestic economy. That's why I do definitely think that uh, the comment that Lillian uh, Pullman has said about reset trade. The way to reset trade is how you make your, econom your economic agents more efficient within your domestic economy through structural reforms. Okay, thanks very much. Um, one of the interesting things about the conference is in the way in which uh, we're hearing that countries which in many ways contrast and are quite different actually have some quite similar interlocking themes. Um, and I'm going to turn to Yi Li Ho, the uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister of Korea. Now we think of Korea as a, an economy which has uh, obviously uh, grown enormously and developed enormously uh, in past decades. Uh, and a technologically advanced economy. Uh, what policies are you now having to put in place to keep that process of development uh, and wealth creation going? I'm going to give you this microphone. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gaps. I'm sorry, Mr. Gepper. I don't want to spoil your name, <laughs> Mr. Gepper. Yeah, well, for your, uh, say, uh, high praise for the Korean economy in the past, we accept this as a very good compliment. But, but these days, we are not in that good situation economically. So our growth rate is around 3%, less than 3%, as a matter of fact. So that uh, we really focused on this uh, sort of reform that can get these two rabbits together, like this productivity growth, and at the same time, social inclusion. So we pursue, we carry out these so-called four, re four sector reforms, labor, education, uh, financial sector, and public sector. Now, first of all, about the, uh, say, about inclusion, we uh, have seen a um, sort of a very good progress as far as income distribution is concerned comparatively, quote-unquote. So as you probably saw this morning's presentation by OECD, our, the, uh, the, the, what is it, the median, uh, the income level is growing very fast compared to the other OECD countries. And as a, probably as a result of that, we have seen the uh, decrease in Gini coefficient, which is good as far as distribution concerned, but much to be desired, as we all know well. So that is the reason why we are going and we are carrying out these four reforms. And it is very say, interesting and at the same time surprising to hear that from our the uh, Portuguese experience that the wage flexibility can go that far to the negative side, uh, which is not done yet in Korea, but uh, that's not that in uh, not that in that direction, but we would like to seek for more flexibility, less rigidity in, in labor market uh, the uh, convention, in a sense. So uh, that's what you are doing now. Now and then, for the uh, public sector reform, which is I believe that it is quite related with the pro pro productivity growth. So that we have uh, civil servants pension reform already done and several other reforms are going well. So if I put it, say at this time, correct uh, briefly, then productivity growth can go and should go together with the social inclusion so that we look for, in a sense, more jobs. And that is the way to guarantee the uh, social inclusion by 
by increasing productivity and in, in the sectors like public education, labor, and financial sector. That, uh, those are the things that we are doing. Uh, just one example for the last point. For the education, I believe that it is the same, tr same is true of the, every other countries. The real importance for us in that reform is that the, how to the, uh, bridge the gap, sort of mismatch between highly educated people and job search. That is very important and we are doing some, we are adopting some measures to correct that. Hopefully we can succeed in that area as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, and we're going to um, f uh, turn to uh, Norway, uh, Siv Jensen. Um, uh, Norway, I guess, the Scandinavian countries in general have been leaders in terms of education, a highly skilled workforce, uh, and of, uh, we think of them as a relatively um, even distribution of wealth and income. But obviously your country is facing the shock of uh, uh, lower oil prices. What are the measures that you're implementing to adjust uh, and try to adjust the structure of the economy and productivity? Well, let me start by saying that uh, fortunately, Norwegian economy is uh, very solid and we have uh, savings, so which means that we have the ability in a shorter term perspective to stimulate our economy through an expansionary fiscal policy, which is good for the time being. Uh, that said, when we uh, took power um, two and a half years ago, we knew that oil investments uh, would peak uh, and that we needed to uh, focus on how to diversify our economy. Uh, and we had seen um, uh, a long period of um, um, falling productivity growth. So we set up a commission, productivity commission. They have given us two reports on what to do. And the main uh, recommendations are uh, more efficient public sector. Um, and despite the fact that we invest a lot in R&D and in uh, education, uh, we need performance to improve. Uh, and also we need um, uh, better returns on investments on infrastructure, which is also increasing a lot. So we set up a plan for uh, structural reforms. They are being implemented um, at high speed, I would say, in uh, all sectors healthcare, um, police sector, public sector, everywhere. Uh, but at the same time, we were hit by the drop in oil prices that actually um, 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 made them uh, problems for the oil and gas related industries um, um, uh, harder to handle, which means that we are seeing a regional increase in unemployment. At the same time, we see um, uh, employment rising in other sectors and in other parts of the economy, which means that um, this transition of our economy is in a focus. We need to stimulate through fiscal policy, uh, and we have the muscles to do that. Uh, we make sure that monetary policy is doing its job. But at the same time, it is crucial for us to make sure that um, structural reforms are implemented, uh, because in the longer term perspective, that's exactly what we need to focus on. Thank you. So um, before uh, we move on to a, a broader debate, um, we're going to have two contributions uh, from the employer side and, and from the uh, worker side. I'm going to start with the employers and business uh, with uh, Phil O'Reilly, chairman of BIAC. Phil, um, uh, we've heard an awful lot about frontier firms and less productive firms, and we've heard, we are hearing a lot about the importance of skills and education. Uh, what does it, uh, but that uh, companies maybe are not performing in productivity terms the way they used to. What's the issue here? What's the problem and, and whose fault is it? Well, thanks, and I was, I was struck actually by Jason Verman's comment in the earlier panel that what we're facing is in terms of what's going on right now is, is not primarily an economic phenomenon, it's a political phenomenon. I thought there's an awful lot of truth to that in terms of the way in which we think about why businesses aren't investing. And, and Catherine Mann's own editorial on the latest economic outlook says business investment is, is ultimately the key, she says, to propelling the economy from a low growth trap to the high growth path. What's getting in the way? And when we ask our members in the productivity frame what's getting in the way, they mention political issues. They say 
the regulatory burden. They say a lack of product market reform. They say the level and complexity on taxes, weak infrastructure, skills gaps and, and policy uncertainty. So my sense is that the best way you're going to get business investment happening and productivity growth happening off the back of that is to do precisely what the OECD is recommending through this Economic Outlook Report, which is to say, sure, uh, take some fiscal headroom if you want to, make sure it's good quality though, really, really focus though on structural reform. Don't let monetary reform, uh, don't let monetary policy carry the heavy lifting anymore. And if you do structural reform and you do it in the right way and you do it with the right conversations going on with business and the right local aspects to it, noting that if you want to get productivity reform in a rural town in New Zealand where I come from, it's going to be different to the way in which you get uh, productivity reform in New York City, obviously. So that kind of local aspect to the whole thing is going to be important too. The most important thing, I think, that policymakers can do to create confidence in the business community about investing is to make sure that they know that when politicians say they're going to do something, that they do it, that it's pro-growth, it's pro-investment, it's pro-competition. If you get that, then you're going to get more businesses not only investing at the margins but being forced to invest because to your point about frontier and follower firms, if those frontier firms don't feel as though they've got much competitive pressure, then they won't do much other than rent seek. What you've got to do is make sure that those fast following firms are following forward, and that's about competition policy, about product market reform. Great, thank you. Oh, we have some applause. Uh, I'll stand for <laughs> um, Yes, we got applause for the non-politician on the stage. I. Um, I'm going to turn to Richard Trumka, um, uh, president of the AFL-CIO. So, Richard, when you hear this clarion call for, from employers for structural reform and getting out of the way, uh, what does it make you feel? Well, uh, John, first of all, I'd like to compliment uh, the OECD uh, on reconciling uh, the old Monday OECD <laughs> that talked about inequality uh, with the Tuesday uh, OECD uh, that talked about policies that took us away or gave us greater inequality. And I'd say with one notable exception, uh, they've reconciled Monday and Tuesday uh, in this outlook. Uh, so I would compliment them wholeheartedly on that. Now, uh, from our perspective, the, the outlook says uh, the three things about the world economy. Uh, first, the world economy remains weak while real unemployment high. And many key economies and uh, deflationary pressures are, are dominant. And the outlook makes a very clear that the fiscal path uh, to jobs uh, and growth, it gives you a, a clear pathway to get there. So that governments that fail to act now uh, really are choosing high unemployment uh, and they're choosing uh, that for their country right now. The second thing it says is we need uh, expansionary fiscal policy and more public investment, both to, to boost growth and to, to drive productivity. And the third, and it's a, a key point that I want to emphasize, it says that the relationship between productivity and wages and between falling unemployment and wages is broken. Not just in the United States where that's been uh, true for decades, but increasingly uh, across uh, other advanced economies. So when you talk about productivity, if that productivity isn't going to be shared or the benefits aren't going to be shared up and down the spectrum, uh, they lack, it lacks a lot of the interest. Uh, so the, the, the OECD's policy recommendations in response, one for fiscal uh, stimulus and public investment, are spot on. We think they're absolutely correct. We agree with them and would encourage everybody. But the OECD's slogan, Go Structural, and I've heard every speaker up here talk about uh, structural uh, reforms. Uh, they, the, Go Structural is right. But to the extent that they're interpreted or they are used to working, lessen workers' bargaining power, they're going in the absolute wrong direction, uh, and we would oppose that or disagree with it. Because there's overwhelming evidence, most recently from the IMF, 
uh, that weakening worker bargaining power, and in particular, weakening of workers' organization has led to the disconnect uh, of wages and productivity. It's led to uh, runaway inequality, and I believe to the political uh, instability uh, and rebirth of the right-wing authoritarian politics uh, that Phil alluded to and a couple of others have alluded to. So if we want to lessen inequality, we need structural reforms that strengthen worker bargaining power uh, and build uh, workers' voice in the economy and in the broader society. And so I, I caution all of my colleagues up here, when you use the word loosely structural change, if it is geared towards lessening worker bargaining power or workers' organizations, you're going to be buying into greater inequality, further disconnect between productivity uh, and, and wages that we need to reestablish. Great. Well, Oh, more applause for the non-politicians. Phil, those weren't even the people that I hired. <laughs> <laughs> Were they the same people? Uh, okay, well, great. Thanks for the panel. I'm going to ask, uh, just, just ask for comments on a couple of issues to do with structural reform on the supply side uh, that we've touched on, but maybe could go slightly deeper. One is education. Um, education is a sort of education and training. Uh, it's the sort of thing that nobody objects to. It sounds good. Um, and, and countries, many countries are talking about that. Um, but when I walk around, um, I'm surrounded by people who seem to be better educated than I am, uh, young people uh, with tertiary degrees, uh, and yet they're not really finding the right job. So what's the right response and what's the right form of education or vocal preparation that uh, we're not seeing. Who's minister? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, no, I think, well, from a Norwegian perspective, I mean, we, we are very much in favor of a free and accessible education system. But what we need to do is to make sure that we perform better uh, all the way especially since we are seeing a more skilled labor market. So what I'm concerned about is not the, the, uh, the high end, it's more the, 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 the group of people with lower education, uh, especially since in a more specialized and a more skilled uh, labor market, uh, we, they would be the first to fall behind unless we uh, make sure that they actually can perform better. So I think we need, that's why we, we put more efforts and more money into the education system. Um, at the same time, when we see the, a more diversified economy. I also think that we should talk more about the um, possibilities that lies in the, the, the growing sharing economy. I think in that, there is also a lot of possibilities uh, for people to get self-employed even for people that has been outside the labor market for quite some time, see opportunities with the growing sharing economy. But that is why it's so crucial that we find good ways to regulate the growing sharing economy. We need to, to modernize the regulations and we need to make sure, I think even in, a, uh, in an international uh, climate, to talk about how we can regulate cross borders uh, and how we can okay. talk about uh, 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 taxation cross borders to, to meet the growing sharing economy uh, with adequate means. Okay, thank you. Um, John, I, I, I'd like to. John, just uh, yes, let me. Please. One of the main problems that uh, we're facing today is how we match the needs of the productive sector with the way the educational sector is designed the curricula. The problem is that what you are finding now is that for every hundred job offers that are out there, the business sector is not finding the right supply of, of people coming out of our schooling system because we have to make a better effort how to align the way we're teaching, the new challenges in this industrial world point six four point zero, because things are moving too fast and we have to adapt the way we're, we're instructing people in the educational sector. Now, some countries, we have to go even deeper like we did in the education reform in Mexico, how to improve the quality of quantitative methods to prepare 
in the basic schooling system for the challenges of technical jobs that the industrial uh, revolution is basically demanding. Thank you. Um, I'd actually like to uh, uh, move on from that to something the minister mentioned about the sharing economy. One thing that struck me listening to this debate has been this question of the frontier firms, the, the advanced firms at the technological uh, boundary frontier. Uh, and yet a lot of the talk is that a lot of these firms are really quite large firms, large sophisticated employers, uh, and that the small employers sometimes are less sophisticated. Now, often when we think about disruption, we think about Silicon Valley, we think of it entirely the other way around, that it's the small disruptors that are advanced and it's the large companies that, that, that are needing to be disrupted and, and need greater competition. So I just would be interested in any reflections from the panel about that. Bill? It's a really interesting phenomenon, isn't it? We, um, the, the, the idea that you've got frontier firms and that they capture, if you like, almost too much of the, of the positive impact of that disruption that they've carried out, they should capture some. Of course they should. The answer, I think, structurally, is to make sure that you've got highly competitive markets and really good regulation so that they don't continue to capture the benefits of that, that they, they get competed against. And if they're good enough, they'll, they'll continue to innovate and continue to take the lead. A great example, which we all use, is the example of Uber. It's a taxi company in anything but name. What you need to do, if you, if you don't like Uber, is just properly regulate taxi companies. It's just as simple as that. Stop saying Uber shouldn't exist and start saying, what have we got wrong in the way in which we regulate taxi companies, that they can't, that those other competitors existing in the market can't also pick up uh, some of that uh, change that, that Uber might have brought along. Second point is, and this is a, that the very interesting point from the Mexican point of view, is we need to make sure that our young children have the right, the kids at school have the right skills in order to pick that up, and that's about science, technology, engineering, and maths, and then about giving them the right information to make the right choices to join some of those fast-following firms so that they can pick up on some of that growth as well. Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, back to <laughs> right. Well, going back to this, uh, the uh, match of this education and 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 job or job training. We uh, Korea is in a sense very uh, in the peculiar position. More than seventy percent of our high school graduates go to the uh, uni colleges, universities. So it is quite different from European countries, for example. Norway and others. So uh, again, there are so many, say, qualified, high, highly educated people who are in the job market every year. And obviously, as a matter of fact, in these days, it is very hard for them to get the job. So that we introduced a kind of a system that the uh, so-called job training can be done by, by the sponsorship of the big corporations, either corporations or big corporations, generally big corporations, they support some kind of education program in the college so that they uh, give out the, cur the curriculum they want, the firms want, and so that these students can be trained in that way and maybe get the job after, the, after their gra graduation. Also, between these so-called large firms, which are so sort of advanced in productivity or have the greater opportunity to capture these highly qualified people with the very, high, uh, very highly productive people. So that we also introduced a kind of uh, new program, which is not yet very new, so uh, which is yet very new, I'm sorry, that these high, so we call them uh, so-called cooperative corporations or cooperative uh, firms upstream or downstream. So large firms finance the program which can train the, the uh, job, uh, the employee or potential employee who are working on these corporate firms in the university so that they can get that kind of desired job training for these small firms in the university and then they graduate and then get the job in small firms. If they do well, then they can get the job in the larger firms or the so-called the, uh, the, the advanced firms. Well, it is just the beginning. 
So we are trying very hard in, in many aspects of this. But I hope that that can be a kind of a model for the future development between this cooperation, I mean, so-called inclusiveness, and also the productivity. Thank you very much. I'm afraid to say that lunch is getting cold. So um, we could go on for a long time on this panel, and there's lots of really interesting issues. But I hope the panel will forgive me uh, if we call the halt here. Uh, since apparently lunch is pressing. Um, I'm just going to encourage the audience who aren't going to the ministerial lunch just to stay in their seats for a little bit uh, while the ministers go to room C and um, have lunch, and the rest of us, I'm sure, can find a sandwich somewhere. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and thanks for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. I think we were uh, getting our cash short.